Okay, class. Uh, today's uh, online lecture is on vision and uh, the eye and the visual system about how the eyes uh, end up helping us in the world of motor learning. So let's talk a little bit about the eye and the anatomy of the eye. So I'm hoping this is uh, somewhat of a review for all of you, uh, but I wanted to make sure that we cover very quickly the structure of the eye and the components and how they end up helping us with, uh, with movement. So, let's see if that works here. So, uh, if you can imagine the light coming in from the outside area and trying to get its way into the eye so that we can recognize things. So, if we go through the, the numbers here, so starting with the cornea, information passes through the cornea, which is the curved area of the outside of the, uh, uh, of the eye. This is kind of the protective layer, but it also helps for the light to be able to bend, as you can see how it's curved, it bends so that the light then is directed into the eye. Uh, it's going to pass through uh, the pupil, which is number two here. This is the space between uh, the elements of the iris, which is number three. Okay, and that's the iris is the color of your eye, uh, but basically it's the uh, the bands that are going to make the the opening of your eye smaller or larger based on the amount of light it wants to let in. So as you can imagine, for those of you who are uh, into photography, this is like the aperture of your lens. Um, if you're in uh, a very highly lit area, then of course your eye is going to constrict so that it only lets a certain amount of light in so that it doesn't overload your visual system. And the exact opposite if you're in a dark situation. If you're in a dark situation, then this area here Okay, this area, this opening, is going to open wide so that it lets the maximum amount of light in so that you can recognize what you're seeing. So as the light passes in through the cornea, through the pupil, and then hits the lens, and the lens is this kind of oddly shaped um, uh, element here uh, where the light is then going to be bent to a particular location on the back of the eye. So as you can imagine, the light comes in even from the outside uh, of your your visual system and gets bent into the pupil, into the lens, which then bends it back again uh, to be able to go into the back of the eye. Now this is a really important piece, this, uh, this lens, in that you know, for those of you who are nearsighted or farsighted, a lot of times it's based on uh, the lens itself and maybe a misshapen lens um, to where the lens that you have is being is directing information either too far back so that you can't focus or too shallow so you can't focus. The objective is obviously to focus it right back on the back of the eyes so that your photoreceptors can uh, take advantage of that. Um, also in older adulthood the lens itself uh, begins to get more stiff and so uh, the muscles here, okay, the, uh, the muscles that are contracting the, uh, the lens and stretching it out or bringing it close together, that's the uh, that's the way that you focus on things. So if you bring um, a book up close to your sorry, a book up close to your eyes, then the lens is going to be adjusted so that the information still projects where it's supposed to. And if you pull that object away from your eye, then hopefully the lens will be able to adjust um, using the muscles to stretch the lens out to be able to adjust to where the uh, the object is. So this is what allows you to focus. And you can imagine as you get older, a couple of things happen. You know, either this lens becomes stiff so that it's not as flexible anymore and it can't adjust quite as well, or the muscles themselves get a little weak to be able to do the adjustment. So that's where we get um, problems later in life with vision and being able to focus on things both close up and far away. Uh, then obviously as the information comes in through the lens, lens projects it to the back of the eye the back of the eye, this, this gray strip all the way around is called the retina and the retina is where the photoreceptors are located that are going to detect the light. So the light hits the photoreceptors, they trigger just like any other uh, sensory receptor in your body, they trigger and send information uh, through the optic nerve which is back here number seven into the brain. Okay, So that's how information passes through. Uh, this middle area, this is area kind of uh, of blood vessels as well as kind of a, a gel-like substance so that um, the healthy eye allows that light to pass through. Uh, let's take another look at it. 
And this is just a slightly more detailed look, um, but you can see all the information that we've already gone over here. So information passing through the cornea and through the pupil hits the lens. The lens projects it back through the vitreous humor here, the, uh, the area in the middle of the, the eyes. You can see it being fed by blood vessels to keep it healthy and then ends up hitting the retina, okay, back in the back, and the retina is where your photoreceptors are located, all right? Just a couple of keys to be, be thinking about. The, the fovea, okay, is the area that uh, is the center of the eye. It's where if you're pointing your eyes directly to an object and you want to get the greatest amount of detail about an object, then your fovea is going to be used. Um, as you get further and further away from the center of your vision, the center of your, uh, your retina, um, you'll end up getting less and less information about that object. Um, many of you have a blind spot. You know that's going to be coming where the optic nerve, uh, where the um, the information travels into the optic nerve, and so therefore there's a blind spot when information is located here, right? Or the information's outside that's being projected there. So that's where we have a blind spot. Um, so yeah, that's that's the basics of the eye. Uh, obviously, we have uh, muscles that are moving the eye around, so that's an important piece of movement uh, in that we're able to actually use our eyes and move them in different locations to be able to track information, as well as to be able to keep up with information as we're moving through the world. So it's an important part of motor learning. So let's talk just uh, about those photoreceptors that I mentioned. Those are on the back of the eye where the retina is. Okay, As part of the retina, you have photoreceptors. And there are two, um, two different types of photoreceptors, the rods and the cones. And again, I, hopefully this is, this is a review from you, uh, for you. But uh, the rods are going to be the things that are located predominantly on the peripheral of your retina and therefore the peripheral of your vision. Um, and those things are helpful in black and white, okay, being able to see uh, um, some detail but not color. Uh, you're also going to be helped in low light situations. So these are going to be the photoreceptors that work more effectively when, you're, when your light uh, source is very low. And they're also very, very helpful with movement in that they are able to trigger fairly quickly so uh, they can help us with movement that's happening in our peripheral area. Uh, the cones on the other hand, the cones are going to be the ones that are located in the center and I have a, a very rough picture down here but you can see when light passes into the eye and then projected on the retina, okay, the center of the area, the closest to the fovea that we pointed to earlier, is where the cones are going to be and the cones are going to help us with color and detail. Okay, they're also going to help be uh, most effective when we have bright light. So this is where we get our detail in the center of our vision, and that makes sense, right? When we want to know about something, we want to read something, we usually look directly at it. So the things in the middle of our vision are going to be things we have the most um, detail about. On the outsides are where the rods are located. So rods and rods, and those are going to be that the things that work well in low light, but also then help us with information about movement. So just to, just to kind of hit that point home, this is a, a graph that shows you um, based on where on the eye and how many degrees away from the center of the eye uh, the rods and the cones are located. So as you can see here in the middle, this spike is going to be the cone density. So about how, mi how many cones per area uh, are located in that uh, general vicinity. So right around the center of our vision, lots of cones. Okay, we have lots of cones around the center of our vision. And the green being the rods, we don't have that many rods. Okay, and even right in the center, we're not going to have very many rods at all. Um, as we get further away from center, we have less cones, and then we have more, much more in terms of rods uh, towards the you know, 20, 40, 60 uh, degrees away from the center of our vision. So as you can just imagine, let me go backwards real quick here. You can just imagine lots of cones here right in the center condensed right in the middle and that's where we have our greatest amount of detail and then it trails off and we get a lot of rods on the outside of our visual uh, visual system okay so so let's talk just a minute about vision and why should we be even thinking about vision uh, in terms of uh, movement and uh, and how we go about uh, doing tasks day to day well as humans we are what we call kind of visual dominant beings and what that means is 
that vision is going to trump all of our other senses whenever we have conflict between them. Okay, visual is, uh, vision is extremely valuable, uh, it's extremely powerful, um, but then also it's, uh, it, it tends to, we tend to use it more, sometimes more than we need to, but uh, we end up using it a lot more than our other senses. So there are certain situations in which we have vision available to us that tell us, tells us one thing, and then our other uh, senses, our, uh, uh, our ability to, to kind of understand our body, our somato sensation, is telling us a different thing. Um, you may be able to think of some situations where that occurs. Um, one of the more popular ones is if you imagine uh, sitting at a stoplight and not really paying attention to what's going on, maybe thinking about something else, and the car next to you begins to, to roll. If the car next to you begins to roll, and you're not necessarily paying attention to them, but in your peripheral vision you see that uh, that car is moving, or, or you should say that the elements in your visual field are moving, a lot of times we end up slamming on the brakes even harder because we have a sense that maybe we're moving. Right? As that car is moving, it gives us the sensation that maybe we're moving as well. So we, we stand on the, uh, the brake a little heavy. Okay, that's where you have sensory conflict. That's where you have information where your vision was telling you that you were moving, your body was telling you you weren't, but yet we kind of believed or we had our vision trump uh, the rest of our, uh, our sensory system. And so vision is powerful. Right? Knowing that it's powerful, we have to understand it and, uh, and recognize how we use it in terms of performing motor skills. Okay, so let's, uh, briefly, I mentioned these terms already, but the idea of focal vision and peripheral vision. Um, think of focal vision, these are areas of the visual field. And when we're, when we're bringing information in from the outside world, uh, there's the information that's in the center of our vision where we get the most detail, where we're using the cones and so therefore we're able to use that for object identification. Okay, If you want to know what an object is, you tend to look directly at it because you're going to get the most information from that object because of the location of the cones. We also have the peripheral vision. The peripheral vision is going to be anything outside of that center few degrees and that's all the other uh, elements of the visual field. And that's where we're going to be using information for, um, we usually will use that information for the elements of the environment, to be able to know our location in the environment, uh, to help with movement, as we said earlier, that rods can help with uh, movement and recognizing uh, uh, what things are passing by us at any given time. So basically these two elements, if you put them together, you have the entire visual field. So there's just a a quick little visual at the bottom. You imagine this person looking forward and, and assuming that they have, let's say, 130 degrees of visual uh, field, uh, view, field of view. This means that they can see if they're looking straight ahead, you know, for a, a fairly wide uh, element or angle of, uh, of view here. The center two degrees or maybe even the two to five degrees is going to be your focal vision. Okay, that's going to be the part of vision where you have the greatest detail. And then outside of that area, this is all called kind of the, the peripheral vision. Uh, sometimes it's called the ambient vision. Okay, that may be another term that's used for it. Um, but the focal vision or foveal vision or central vision, all, all terms that mean basically the same thing, that's going to be where that detail is going to be the, the, the sharp, uh, sharpest. Okay, so you can imagine your focal vision being the center, the peripheral vision being everything outside of that. All right, a couple more things here. I just I have some terms, so I want to make sure you understand the terms, and then we'll talk in class more about uh, how it's all used. Um, one of the things that people have uh, done research on in terms of vision, and specifically in terms of the, the movement, uh, movement behavior world, is how we go about timing an object that gets to us. How do we go about catching an object? How do we go about reaching out and touching an object when there's this connection between us and the outside world? And if you remember back when we said proprioception was our ability to perceive how our body was oriented at any given time, but extraoception is the understanding of the outside world, right? Our, our recognition of what's in the outside world. So one of the, I think one of the coolest parts about movement is usually being able to time something and recognize when something is going to get to us. So 
there was a, an optical variable that was created to basically understand or to suggest that this is what humans do and that humans may end up using this optical variable and um, so the idea is that time to contact the amount of time it took an object to get to me my recognition of that is going to be determined by what's called tau t-a-u okay tau is the optical variable that helps us with information about time to contact okay good example of this would be uh, an outfielder in baseball right the balls hit to them how do they know when their um, they should have their glove up to be able to catch the object how do we know them when they should clamp down on the glove so that they can catch the ball and they know that by kind of tracking the ball through the world right so uh, this idea of tau is basically saying that as humans we take the size of an object in our visual field and then use the the change of the size of the object so how quickly that object is changing uh, in order to recognize when it's going to get to us so when I'm looking at that baseball I'm watching it and seeing how fast the size of the object is changing if it's changing really fast it means it's coming really fast at me uh, if it's changing very slowly it means that it's not progressing that slowly or not progressing that fast towards me and by understanding the size of the object in the real world what it should look like and comparing that to the the size of the uh, uh, the object in your visual field you begin to see when an object's going to reach you and that helps us understand lots of different movements such as our moving through the world and knowing when an object's going to be um, when we're going to reach an object that we're uh, running towards for example how do you know when you're going to hit a puddle that is you know quarter mile away and you're running towards it well you know that by this the the change in the size of that object in your in your vision and its relationship to other things so one other piece that I want to uh, talk about actually uh, maybe a couple others here but they re uh, relate is that vision is something that we use when we want to bake when we want to make corrections and our ability to make corrections um, is utilize we're utilizing vision in order to do that but we also have to have enough time and enough information to be able to do that so when you think about um, my ability to reach out and grab something okay that's called kind of the, the idea of prehension right prehension is the term where you have a reach and grasp okay where you're actually using the aperture of your fingers and the aperture being the the width of your fingers and you're honing in on an object to be able to pick it up well for me to do that if I were to reach out and grab a, a pen okay I'll put a pen in front of me here if I was to reach out and grab the pen Okay, well, to do that, I have to actually be able to recognize how far away my hand is from the pen. So obviously, I'm pretty good at doing that because I know the size of the pen. I also know the relationship the pen has to my fingers and to be able to hone in on it. Now, if I was doing that fairly quick, and let's say it's in front of me and I'm reaching out and grabbing that object, that there's really a couple of different phases that have to happen. Okay, if I'm going to use vision to be able to help me with that, which obviously it's extremely beneficial to have vision, I really need kind of a, a three-phase model of my movement. Okay, and this three-phase model, as you can see right here, includes the preparation, okay, which is my scanning of the object that I'm reaching for and then preparing how I'm going to approach it. My initial flight, okay, which is me sending my hand towards that object. And then the termination phase. And the termination phase is going to be where I then slow down my movements. Okay, so just like we talked about in class the other day, when you have a closed loop model of movement, the closed loop, remember, is when I take vision and I make corrections based on my vision. So therefore, uh, I may end up reaching to the object and getting my arm going towards that object. And when I get close to the object and I start to use vision to be able to see how far away I am, then I start to hone in, right? And I send additional signals out to be able to um, change my movement to be able to adjust to where the object is. So if you think about um, anything that requires me to have accuracy where I'm going to be utilizing my my vision, I really need a certain amount of time in order to respond to that vision. 
So up here, as you can see, I have you know, this estimate of 100 to 160 milliseconds minimum that are needed in order for someone to use vision to make a correction in your movement. So if I reach really, really quick and I don't give myself that period of time, let's say I reach as fast as I can for an object and I don't give myself that 100 to 160 milliseconds or even more to be able to process my visual information, then I'm cutting out the remaining of the phase. I'm cutting out the termination phase, right? So if I reach really, really fast, it means that all I had time to do was prepare and send my initial flight. And then I was just hoping that everything was going to be accurate from there on. Okay, But if I go slow, then I have the preparation, the initial flight, and the termination phase, all three are happening. Okay, So this is just a, a thought for you, you can put this all together, but if you eliminate the termination phase of a movement, okay, you have what kind of loop um, when you're actually performing the skill. So be thinking, what, what kind of loop do I have if I don't have a termination phase, and what loop am I using if I do have a termination phase? Okay, Just a, a quick example of this as I have at the bottom. You know, a hard line drive in, in baseball, okay, for a shortstop, for example, a hard line drive that's coming at that, uh, that player, a lot of times the success of their movements or success of their ability to catch has a lot to do with where their hands are to begin with. Okay, because if your hands are not in the right position, you usually don't have enough time to use the vision to be able to make that correction. And if you do, a lot of it depends on um, whether or not you're efficient enough to make the correct movement because you're not going to have time to do this termination phase. You're not going to have time to hone in your object on a, on a really hard line drive. Okay, a slow ball that's coming to you, sure, you can get your hands there and you can make an adjustment based on where the ball goes. Okay? All right. Um, I'll end up talking about this more in class, but uh, same idea. I already mentioned the idea that you know you've got this reaching and grasping, which is prehension. Um, and I just wanted to kind of stress to you that the different areas of the visual field provide different information when we do these tasks. So remember the central and peripheral uh, uh, parts of the visual field. Well, if I'm reaching and grasping for this pen again, okay, so I've got the pen in front of me and I'm going to reach out and grasp that object. Okay, well, think about what my central vision does, a very small part of my visual field, wherever my eye is pointed, and think what my peripheral vision does, which is the remaining of my visual field. And as I have here, the peripheral vision is going to help me with the environment that I'm in, what's around me, if there's something in my way that I need to reach over or something I need to reach around. Um, it's going to help me with the moving limb. Okay, notice that when I reach for that object, I'm usually looking at the object. I don't look at my, uh, my hand and watch my hand go all the way there. I watch the object. And so as my central vision is focused on the object, my peripheral vision is giving me an understanding of where my hand is and how it's traveling towards the object to, to determine whether or not I need to make an adjustment. If you end up blocking my peripheral vision, let's say that you gave me goggles where I only have the center part of my vision available, then you're going to have problems with my transport phase. My transport is me reaching towards the object. You're going to have some inaccuracies with transport. Okay, You won't have any, any inaccuracies with my grasp because when I eventually get there, I'm able to grasp because I can see my fingers and the object in the same central part of my vision. Okay, But certainly I'm going to have some problems with accuracy in terms of the transport of my arm. Whereas with central vision, that gives me information about the object itself, the size of the object, the, uh, the expected density of the object, right? the shape of the object, how I need to grab it. Um, and if you block central vision, so let's say I'm pointing my eyes directly at the, uh, the object, but yet you put goggles on that take that center part away. So now I can't actually see the object that I'm pointed to. Well, if you have me now reach and grasp, I'm going to have problems with both the transport and the grasp phase, specifically the grasp phase, right? Because that's where my fingers reaching onto the object will have a trouble. Um, but it also has problems with the transport because you don't have information about the object, and therefore the information about the object is uh, keeping you from have the best having the best um, information to start that initial uh, transport um, portion of the grasp. So. Central and peripheral kind of do different things, and uh, when we remove them, then we get to see what exactly they do. 
and of course all of this is kind of uh, all this is assuming that the person is not good enough yet to do it on their own. If the person is very good and they practice this reaching and grasping of this pen over and over a thousand times, then they can probably do it with their eyes closed, and so therefore blocking uh, information doesn't really matter. Okay, but someone who's just learned how to do the task or is just now uh, working on that specific new situation, then this is what's going to happen with uh, elements of the visual field that are being blocked. Okay, so. Last piece here, um, lots of elements that go into um, uh, when we go and move throughout the world and how vision helps us out. Another uh, situation is locomotion. Okay? And uh, vision is certainly helpful in the area of locomotion. Um, think, for example, of you uh, going out on a run and you're running through, uh, let's, say, let's say you're running through the woods and you've got all sorts of things that you have to watch out for. You have to watch out for branches, you have to watch out for objects on the ground that you need to jump over or, or get past or uh, make sure that you don't step on. Well, vision helps us with that, right? I mean, vision is probably the, the key element behind that. Um, I mean, we use some of our other senses as well, but none of them are even close to hel as helpful as vision can be. So what about our different points of vision? So peripheral vision is going to be extremely helpful for what's called optic flow. And optic flow is a term that I'd like you to remember, this term optic flow. And that's basically suggesting the passing of the environment past you okay, is called optic flow. So imagine, you know, I'm running through the world and all sorts of trees and everything are going past me. Well, that's information that's reaching my brain to tell me not only how fast I'm going, but you know whether I'm upright, whether I'm getting close to objects, that sort of thing. Even though my eyes aren't watching them, okay, information is passing through my visual, my peripheral vision, um, in order to give me information about the environment. But also, I tend to use all this other stuff, even like towel, right? That I mentioned earlier, your ability to come in contact with an object. Okay, if there's a branch on the ground that you have to jump over. You're going to use tau in order to recognize when you're getting close enough to that object that you need to start your jump. Okay, Obviously, you may not have ever run this course before. You may not have ever encountered the same limb, but you're going to have a better idea of when to do it because of your tracking of that object. Um, so you use that tau in order to recognize when you need to hone in on your movement. So as I have here at the bottom, there's probably two phases in which we do that. You accelerate right to be able to go towards that object but then toward the end you could probably do some zeroing in okay this is exemplified when we show people on a long long a long jump okay think about a long jump all right a long jump is something where i'm hoping to run as fast as possible and keep that speed up so that when i take off the ground i've got as much momentum as i can to go through the world right so Olympic athletes, they should try to get as fast as humanly possible right at the point that they're going to take off from the board and not slow up. Okay, But when you examine what happens with long jumpers, they're actually, for the most part, okay, except maybe the, the highest of elite, there's a slowing down that happens when they get towards the board. Right? So they're going to get as fast as they can go, and then all of a sudden their speed starts to slow down right before they hit the board. So what does that tell us? tells us that we're using vision, right? We wouldn't slow down if we didn't, uh, if we weren't using vision at all. Okay, if we, if we weren't having vision as being a component of that movement, then we would just get as fast as we could and time it and try to take off at the right location. But since we see people slowing down, it basically says there's an acceleration phase and then there's a zeroing in phase. Okay, and that zeroing in is basically like an, uh, a closed loop model where you're taking visual information, making adjustments based off so that you can time it to be able to take off right at the right time. Okay, so vision is an extremely powerful component of, uh, of our sensory system. Uh, it's probably the most um, dominant of the elements of our system, so therefore we tend to use it over all other elements. Uh, visual dominance is that term that I, I mentioned earlier. And we use the, the different components of vision in lots of different ways, and uh, um, as you can see with uh, reaching grasp, locomotion, okay, catching, 
all of these are utilizing vision in different ways, but our different components of the visual field are going to help us throughout that process. So we'll talk more about it in class. Right? I know that was a lot of information, but uh, uh, hopefully you can go back through it if you need, uh, if you need more help. There's also uh, several good videos online about the anatomy of an eye. Uh, and so I would encourage you, if you want to see more, to pull up uh, YouTube and kind of start looking at some of the, uh, the anatomy uh, animations that they have. All right. Thanks.